this started actually in the late 1960s when our Vice Chancellor of the time, that was Colin Maiden, was over in the United States and saw the disturbances that were happening on the campuses there because of the marginalisation and disenfranchisement of Native American, uh, Afro-American and Hispanic communities. He realised immediately that he would need to do something very quickly about the marginalisation of Māori. So he came back and asked several of the professors here at the time what should this university do to better serve Māori students. And this was one of the things that they recommended. The Marae was really a place where Māori would feel safe on the university, where they wouldn't feel marginalised, um, where they'd feel that they were valued and that our culture was valued, but it was also a physical statement of the fact that Māori do actually exist in this country and play a very important and fundamental role. The Vice-Chancellor himself actually fought very, very hard to get this, but he was stymied by bureaucrats in Wellington. The ministry, whoever it was who was dealing with it, did not want to know. What he was able to get was the academic unit here that we call Rehutai, that's where the Māori Studies Department actually is housed. So what happened was, this used to be a car park, and where the meeting house is now used to be the rugby shed. There had been a whole lot of money from parking fees down here that had never ever been spent. And so the staff of the university gave their parking fund so that we could build this whare nui here. There was no brief as such at the time, the idea was there. There was to be two functions for the marae, a teaching space and the traditional cultural aspect of marae and the whare, whare kai. Ivan was marvellous. He knew that he knew nothing about Māori architecture. They told me I should meet Pino Tāpa, who was a quite a well-known carver. Pine took Ivan on a tour of the East Coast to introduce him to East Coast meeting houses. We went around with him for three days visiting various marae and it was really quite an educational experience for me. If you look at the shape of the house and the, the soap on the walls, they're very, very short, the walls, but you've got a very tall building in there. And that is a very traditional um, shape of a building. The architecture follows that sort of shape. The actual building of it was done under the guidance of a whole lot of very senior elders from throughout the north. One of the most exciting things about this is that the carvings were all done on site. Tuka Tuka was done here. The master carver was Pakariki Harrison from the east coast, from Ngāti Pro. The way that Paki Harrison conceived this particular whare nui was that it would contain all the major figures within the Māori knowledge system. What the house does it, is it depicts the oneness of the world that we live in and the inside of that house is a metaphor for the entire world. So on one side you have a sequence of uh, uh, whakairo nākau or Māori wood carvings which show ancestors who led migratory waka or canoes to New Zealand and some of those uh, Ancestors too include Pacific ancestors and European ancestors. On the other side of the house we see a series of ancestors who are founding ancestors, so people who are really important for founding uh, tribal districts. And in between you see a number of very important ancestors on very special parts of the house. For example, the main columns that hold up the supporting posts and particularly at the back of the house too, which represent the cosmological ancestors, the ancestors that were part of Māori creation. The house is named after Tananuyarangi, who is the principal deity for Māori. He is the one that is usually associated with um, having care of the forests, the birds, but he's also the deity that is responsible for knowledge. This house actually depicts the physical form of Tananuyarangi, so the kōrudu, the, the, the carving at the top of the house, that is his head. The maihi are the arms outside, and those arms there are to welcome everybody. The ridge pole on the top is his backbone. Inside you will see that there are a whole lot of, um, we call them the ribs anyway, 
And you'll see on one side what they call fai fai, they're blue in colour representing the sea, and on the other side they're green in colour representing the land. So the whole house represents a, a physical landscape, an ancestral landscape, a cosmological lands, landscape and a creative landscape. So if you go into that meeting house you will actually see a history, tradition and the culture of Māori entirely encapsulated within that house. It is used practically every day of the week, including the weekends. Our classes are taught here, particularly those involving the language and those involving the traditions where we need to use the house. Many of our students have weddings in here and that's lovely. Our university kapahaka groups practice down here all the time. For me, the most important meeting hui that we have on this marae is our graduation, where the whānau, the extended families of the students come here and celebrate the achievement. I come past here quite often and I like uh, walking around the place. There are two aspects for architecture. One is that it works and that it relates well to the site, and I think this does. And I know that our staff like working in the spaces they've got. It's an amazing house. It would be one of the best in the country for depicting Māoridom as a whole. As we continue to move towards more student-focused learning technologies and presentation styles, places like this become important because we can use it to almost demonstrate or be a visual, a cultural, a conceptual resource for explaining different sorts of knowledge systems apart from just Western. Students and staff of this university have priority for the use of this marae, but it must always be used as a marae. It is not just a building that can be used for whatever purpose. It is a marae, and we protect that very, very carefully.